So in this video, we're going to be talking about ideas and symbols in Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Ideas about evil, spirituality, violence, and the end of the world. This video is really going to assume you've already read the book, since not only am I going to spoil the entire thing, but also because we're going to be talking about specific symbols and characters from the book, and if you don't know the story or context that surround them, it's not going to be nearly as powerful or as interesting for you. Ultimately, this book isn't a philosophical essay, and teaching us philosophical ideas isn't the main thing it's trying to do. It's much more of a fire and brimstone doomsday prophecy. And what it really wants to do is to terrify us. No dry academic analysis of the book on its own is really going to be able to do that justice. If you haven't read the book yet, and you think you can handle something very, very dark, I can't recommend it enough. I can't promise you will enjoy the book, but you probably won't forget it anytime soon. But before we dive into all that dark, to better understand Cormac McCarthy, I first want to talk about another novelist that greatly inspired him, Fyodor Dostoevsky. In terms of writing style, Dostoevsky and McCarthy have very little in common. But in terms of the themes and the ideas that both explore, they couldn't be more similar. In a broad, overarching sense, both authors seem to be in the same tradition as the Book of Job. Both explore the darkest parts of life and humanity, and they try to turn off every single light they can to get as dark as possible, so that maybe, in total darkness, they might find the tiniest little spark of hope they can't quite extinguish. Obviously, not the brightest hope, but maybe something enduring. But if we get a little more specific about what these guys have in common, in several of his books, McCarthy actually steals and reimagines one of Dostoevsky's most famous scenes. That is, the Grand Inquisitor scene from the Brothers Karamazov. A scene where the character Ivan Karamazov explains to his religious little brother why he does not believe in God. Or more directly, why the universe is a terrible place, and if God does exist, he's an evil, terrible jerk that shouldn't be worshipped. And of course, he starts off with the usual stuff, like war and the suffering and the torture of children. But then, to make his ultimate point, he tells a story he made up about the Grand Inquisitor. And it's a story where Christ comes back to life during the Spanish Inquisition and is immediately arrested and sentenced to death. Then the whole thing is pretty much a one-sided dialogue between the Grand Inquisitor and Jesus where the Grand Inquisitor does all the talking and explains why the church has to put Jesus to death. In the dialogue, we can say that the Grand Inquisitor represents power and our abilities as humans to judge and impose order on the world around us, whereas Christ represents our capacity for selfless love. But basically, the Grand Inquisitor gives a lot of reasonable, persuasive arguments for why the love Christ represents is actually useless and dangerous. Like, sure, the world would be better off if we were all as selfless and loving as Jesus. Okay, but clearly people aren't like that, right? And it's been 2,000 years, and Christ's message hasn't really changed people all that much. Look at the effects of universal spiritual love on history, and the effects are totally negligible. But what about power? Uh, obviously, power changes the world all the time. And with enough power, you could bring about world peace. You can enforce harmony and order. You can end starvation and feed the world. And that's what the church is actually trying to do. Because they're the ones 
who actually love everybody. Jesus, he only cares about the saints. The few people, if any, who can follow his impossible commands and be like him. The Inquisitor loves everybody and he's going to save the whole world. A living, breathing Christ can only get in his way and challenge his authority. And these arguments put Jesus in a very awkward position. There's nothing he can really say back. If he argues and he fights and he uses his sick debate skills on the Inquisitor, he's also just using power. And implicitly, he's agreeing with the Inquisitor. And that's exactly the sort of confirmation the Inquisitor is hoping for, right? If Jesus is just another power-hungry dude, then everyone is. If the most perfect example of selfless love isn't actually all that selfless, if he's just another guy trying to get his way and impose his will on everyone else, then in a sense, love doesn't really exist. And that would be very freeing for the Inquisitor. He can finally extinguish that last little remnant of love in his heart and do what he's got to do without looking back. But Christ just can't make things that easy on the guy. He doesn't argue at all. He doesn't even say a word. He just gets up. He looks the Inquisitor in the eyes. He holds him and gently kisses him on his bloodless, 90-year-old lips. That is the whole answer. Right? Christ sees that deep down, the Inquisitor doesn't actually want to take over the world. What he sees in front of him is a lonely old dude that has forgotten what human connection feels like. So he gives the Inquisitor what he's really looking for, and he shows him genuine love. And for a moment, the Inquisitor is made aware of a long-forgotten part of himself the child in him that only ever wanted to be loved. And for a moment, the Inquisitor is shaken to his core. But ultimately, nothing changes for the Inquisitor. He can't bring himself to kill Jesus anymore, but he still sends him away and tells him to never return. And he goes back to trying to rule the world. So in the end, the Inquisitor is still basically right. Christ's love is pretty much useless, and for all practical purposes, it's like it might as well not exist. For Ivan Karamazov, this represents an impasse that pretty much all of us are in. We can't bring ourselves to fully extinguish our desire for love, but it's also pretty much useless to us, and we'll almost never find any actual place for it in the world. And when we try to force love to materialize and try to impose it on the world, we only impose our own will, judgments, and personal sense of order. And so our ability to love seems only to continue to exist to mock us for the way the world really is, and the lonely grand inquisitors it inevitably turns us into. McCarthy addresses similar ideas in his book The Crossing. When a blind man explains to the young main character why justice is impossible in the world. The order which the righteous seek is never righteousness itself, but is only order. The disorder of evil is in fact the thing itself. While the righteous are hampered at every turn by their ignorance of evil, to the evil all is plain, light and dark alike. Right? He's saying a psychopath never needs to lie to himself. He can say to himself, I love evil, I'm going to go do some evil stuff today. But why would he even bother having that conversation with himself? Why would he need to justify himself even to that degree? All justification is useless to him. But a person that is capable of love is stuck continually justifying himself with reference to that love. But his justifications and the order they seek to justify will always disconnect him from it. Furthermore, he says... The picture of the world is all the world men know, and this picture of the world is perilous. That which has given him to help make his way in the world has power also to blind him to the way his true path lies. Right? We're trapped in the order and categories we've created for ourselves, disconnected from the real world. They keep us alive, but they also disconnect us from ourselves and what we desire most. The realities of love forever elude our categories and systems. 
and our systems inevitably keep us at a distance from these realities. Imposing our own will is the opposite of selfless love, so the orders we impose on the world necessarily preclude love and fail to ever grasp it. The very attempt of our minds to grasp it already distorts it unrecognizably, and so we are doomed to see love, as the Apostle Paul said, as in a mirror, darkly, rarely if ever face to face. But let's stop talking about other books, and don't worry if you don't fully understand the relationship between the Inquisitor and Christ yet, because McCarthy reimagines this relationship for us with the two central characters of the book we're actually here to talk about. Finally, let's discuss Blood Meridian. It should be pretty obvious who the Grand Inquisitor is in the context of Blood Meridian. A suzerain rules even where there are other rulers. His authority countermands local judgments. The judge placed his hands on the ground. This is my claim, and yet everywhere upon it are pockets of autonomous life. Autonomous. In order for it to be mine, nothing must be permitted to occur upon it, save by my dispensation. Right, the judge's desired title of suzerain of the earth is basically synonymous with the title of Grand Inquisitor. Like the Inquisitor, the suzerain isn't a king, and he doesn't have to sit around all day and manage every little aspect of his kingdom. But his power is also greater than that of a king, because he has the ultimate veto over everything, and all kings are ultimately subject to him. But he only needs to intervene for a moment here or there when things begin to contradict his will. His rule is almost effortless. The world seems to bend to his will simply as a matter of course. He is like God. He is the final judgment, the measure of all things. And the judge is not just talking about having this authority over the laws of men, but over the laws of nature herself. The judge believes that we all naturally seek this same authority simply by observing clearly the world around us. That man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry will by that decision alone have taken charge of the world. We are all like Caesar, and to see the world is automatically to conquer. And of course the judge wants to see everything and to encompass the entire world with his mind. Whatever in creation exists without my knowledge, exists without my consent. Only nature can enslave man, and only when the existence of each last entity is routed out and made to stand naked before him, will he be properly suzerain of the earth. Right, the judge is the ultimate expression of human ego. He does in more extreme, explicit ways something we all do in implicit, more subtle ways, which brings us, more or less, to Nietzsche's idea of the will to power. As a helpful metaphor, imagine the world is like a collective dream, and we're all unconsciously shaping the dream around us all the time, including all the other dreamers around us. And so necessarily, we're all trying to be the most powerful dreamer, and trying to make everyone else a part of our dream rather than us being shaped by them and becoming an object in theirs. Or to put it another way, imagine our mind is like a spider, and the world is this tangled up tapestry, and merely by observing the world we're constantly pulling threads out of the tapestry, and our mind is always spinning these threads into a beautiful web of order. But there are also other minds spinning the same threads at the exact same time. So we're all always trying to spin all the other spiders into our web before we're spinned into theirs. Throughout the book, the judge makes a million references to how our mind shapes the world, but I don't want anyone to get confused and think that means the judge is trying to say the world only exists in our head or something like that. That's an idea that generally comes from Western philosophy. Descartes, Berkeley, whatever. But if we look at the things that McCarthy actually seemed to read and reference at the time of writing Blood Meridian, he was much more influenced by things like Christian mysticism and Zen Buddhism. He actually quotes Christian mystic Jakob Burma at the very beginning of Blood Meridian, and the subtitle of Blood Meridian, The Evening Redness in the West, 
is a direct reference to the subtitle of Jakob Burma's most famous book, which has the incredibly long title of Aurora, that is, the day spring, or dawning of the day in the Orient, or morning redness in the rising of the sun. All of that is just to say you'll understand the stuff the judge is saying a lot better if you understand the very common mystical concept of a distinction between the world of form which we create with our minds and we experience on a daily basis and the world without form which we can basically never truly experience. It might be called emptiness or the void or the ground of being or whatever, but the idea isn't that the universe doesn't exist without our minds, but that without our minds it is an indescribable, unimaginable chaos. Or as the judge puts it, the truth about the world is that anything is possible. Had you not seen it all from birth and thereby bled it of its strangeness, it would appear to you for what it is. A hat trick in a medicine show, a fevered dream, a trance be populate with chimeras, having neither analog nor precedent. And this distinction brings us to the interesting relationship between the judge and God. When he's in prison, the kid has a weird nightmare of the judge standing next to a coin maker. It is this false moneyer with his gravers and burins who seeks favor with the judge, and he is at contriving from cold slag brewed in the crucible a face that will pass, an image that will render this residual specie current in the markets where men barter. Of this is the judge judge, and the night does not end. Coin Mac McCarthy is obsessed with coin metaphors, and actually in All the Pretty Horses, he uses a coin maker as a metaphor for God. And a character basically asks us to imagine a coin maker who makes a coin. And ten years later, somebody flips that coin to decide if some random person, unbeknownst to the coin maker, lives or dies. The coin maker, in some sense, decides the man's fate. But it's not something he foresaw, planned out, or had any feelings about. He's just some myopic guy sitting at his desk making the coins that decide life and death. Similarly, in The Crossing, a man has a dream about God, and he sees God as a weaver, and he is weaving the world. In his hands it flowed out of nothing, and in his hands it vanished into nothing once again. Endlessly. Endlessly. The idea being in both versions that God is just thoughtlessly creating the present moment. He doesn't remember what he's created before, nor does he have any plans for what he's going to do next. It's all just stuff. He makes it, he throws it away, and then he makes some more. Endlessly. Endlessly. Even he doesn't know what he is, or when or why he started. And that chaos is pretty terrifying on its own. But then right beside the coin maker, looking over him, stands the judge. God might make the coins, but the judge is the one who sets their value, and gets to stamp his face on them. The world of form is his domain, and we all live out our lives in the world of the judge, right? We're all trapped in our own individual egos, but all of our egos in turn are also trapped by the most powerful ego, or dreamer, or spider, the one that gets to shape all other egos. But what does that actually look like? What does it actually mean to be the most powerful dreamer or spider? How is it decided who gets to be the final judge? War is the testing of one's will and the will of another within that larger will which because it binds them is therefore forced to select. War is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. Right, War is the third party that selects between different judges and dreamers. It is the flipping of the coin maker's coins, God unwittingly selecting his champion. But while this decision may be deeply arbitrary, it is not random nor completely unpredictable. War does favor certain qualities after all, and the one that stamps his face on the coin will be the one that most truly embodies war. But what does it look like to be the embodiment of war? Obviously, it probably involves a lot of killing, and probably some scalping. But we also have to understand that for the judge, war has to go far beyond that. You have to totally erase 
someone else's will. You can't just kill the dreamer, you also have to kill the dream. The orders others have created in the world cannot be allowed to have any control over you or dictate your actions. So you must destroy those other orders or sublimate them to your own will. For instance, the judge is always finding ancient artifacts and drawing them in his little notebook and then destroying them forever. He gathered up the artifacts and cast them into the fire. Then he sat with his hands cupped in his lap and he seemed much satisfied with the world as if his counsel had been sought at its creation. That's total victory, because all that exists now of that other culture is the image the judge has of them. You can't know anything about them other than how the judge perceived them and what they meant to him. Only his version of them continues to exist, like the Gauls now pretty much only exist as seen through the eyes and works of Caesar who destroyed them. Or, as another great example, Think of the buffalo bones being piled up in mountains at the end of the book. The old buffalo hunter tells us, On this ground alone between the Arkansas River and the Concho, there was eight million carcasses, for that's how many hides reached the railhead. Two years ago, we pulled out from Griffin for a last hunt, finally found a herd of eight animals, and we killed them and we come in. They're gone. Every one of them that God ever made is gone as if they'd never been at all. The buffalo were the primary food source for many of the tribes of the Great Plains, and killing them was a means of directly killing many, many of these people. But the buffalo was also much more than a food source for these people. For peoples like the Lakota, the buffalo was what they made their housing out of. It was what they made their tools out of. It was what they made their clothes out of. The buffalo were also at the center of their origin myths and their religion. And maybe we could even say that the herds of tens of millions of buffalo would have covered so much of the plains that they could almost be considered a geographical feature, inseparable from the land itself. A land which its inhabitants probably would have considered at some point more or less synonymous with the entire world or universe, or at least the center of the universe. That is to say, the buffalo were an entire world, and killing them was an apocalypse for these people the killing of an entire world of order, of dreams that will never be dreamed again. Right, that's the level of war and genocide that the judge is talking about. And this issue of destroying the influence and the will of another brings us to the judge's obsession with origins and with fathers. Right, he tells us a long weird story about two fathers, one that murders the other one. And the son of the murderer spends the rest of his life trying not to be like his horrible murdering father. And the son of the murdered father is trapped trying to live up to the saintly image he has of the dead father he never really knew. And the priest responds to the story, It strikes me that either son is equal in the way of disadvantage. Right, this is all a very classical Freudian idea. To become your own man, you have to demythologize your father and kill whatever image you have of him. If you are stuck forever with an image of your father as a saint or a devil, he will forever dictate your life. It's only when you realize that he's just a human being, and you are capable of anything he is, for better or worse, that you are able to surpass him and create your own values. For the judge, though, these ideas don't just apply to our individual lives, but also to the histories of peoples and civilizations. Specifically, he tells this story in relation to the modern tribes of Mexico, living under the gaze of the Anasazi Pueblo rock dwellings. They are the products of an extinct culture, much like the ruins left behind after the fall of Rome. And similarly, we might imagine that the judge would characterize the people of the European Middle Ages as being trapped by the godlike image of their Roman fathers. They idolized a previous culture they believed they could never live up to, but also that they could never forget or let go of. The Renaissance could be like Europe finally unmasking their dead fathers and actually reading the Greeks and Romans and going, oh, these were dummies just like us, and believing they could actually build on the things they had done and go further. But the judge characterizes the Mexican tribes as still trapped in this same sort of dark age. The tools, the art, the buildings, 
These things stand in judgment on the latter races, yet there is nothing for them to grapple with. The old ones are gone, like phantoms, and the savages wander these canyons to the sound of ancient laughter. Right, despite being dead, the Anasazi are still dangerous in inflicting their will on the modern tribes, and in fact, they're even more dangerous now that they're dead, because if they were alive, the modern tribes could easily see that they're just human beings, and then kill them and surpass them. Now we can also add that these ideas about fathers aren't only about cultures in relation to one another, but also refer to the relationship that individual persons have to their own culture, right? We all grow up in some culture, and people give us concepts like good and evil, and we're often trapped living out a paradigm others have made for us. And even if we decide to live in contradiction to that paradigm, embracing evil rather than good, for instance, our lives are still being dictated by those concepts. This is why for the judge, to be the ultimate expression of ego and the ultimate embodiment of war, the judge's ideal is to be as close as possible to having no father and no origin. In his nightmare of the judge, the kid sees the judge as totally self-created. Whatever his antecedents, he was something wholly other than their sum. Nor was there a system by which to divide him back into his origins, for he would not go. Whoever would seek out his history through what unraveling of loins and ledger books must stand at last darkened and dumb, at the shore of a void without terminus or origin. In part, this is a description of our own egos, right? Suddenly we go from being kids to being teenagers, and all of a sudden we can judge the world for ourselves and impose order. And this weird superpower seems to come out of nowhere. And the first thing it wants us to do is to separate ourselves from our parents and differentiate ourselves such that we have our own individual wills that we can impose on others. But this also finally brings us to the judge's relationship with the kid, right? When the judge is asked how one should raise a child, he explains that they should be put in a pit with wild dogs, abandoned naked in the desert, and be made to choose between multiple doors, some of which contain lions, blah blah blah. Basically, they should raise themselves and have no fathers and no origins like him. But who in the story does that upbringing actually kind of describe? The kid, who the judge is weirdly obsessed with throughout the book. The kid's father basically gives him nothing, but is also alive, so the kid knows without a doubt that his father is just some bum, and some dumb animal that thoughtlessly created him. As far as we know, the kid thinks nothing of his father. And then he runs away and grows up fighting sailors in the place of wild dogs. Because of this, the kid has a unique ability to be his own father and dictate his own values. As he first heads to Texas, the narrator tells us, Only now is the child finally divested of all that he has been. His origins are become remote, as is his destiny. He is free to create himself and be the child of his own uninfluenced ego, to be the child of the judge. But the judge's high hopes for him are ultimately disappointed. He says to the kid in his prison cell, Don't you know that I'd have loved you like a son? For the judge, the kid is a kind of failed experiment, somebody who could have embodied war perfectly, but instead betrayed man's highest calling. And for this, the judge also sees the kid as his greatest threat. But who is the kid? Basically, he is the Christ to the judge's grand inquisitor. Despite being a violent little murderer, the kid represents the innocence in all of us, which throughout our lives the world is constantly stabbing and kicking in the face. But nonetheless, we can never fully be rid of it. The child's face is curiously untouched behind the scars, the eyes oddly innocent. But to be clear for McCarthy, innocence isn't synonymous with being saintly or perfectly loving, which brings us to a repeated theme in the book which is characters giving us different perspectives on the least of creatures. And interestingly, all of these different perspectives happen to perfectly describe the kid. First, the hermit tells us, you can find meanness in the least of creatures. 
Right Throughout many of his books, McCarthy is constantly reminding us that dogs, horses, and children all love war and violence. He tells us right off the bat about the kid, in him already broods a taste for mindless violence. So the kid is not a very saintly Christ figure, and he very much supports the judge's idea that war endures because young men love it, and old men love it in them. But oddly, at the same time, the judge sees the kid as the only one in the gang to truly contradict him. You alone were mutinous. You alone reserved in your soul some corner of clemency for the heathen. Now this is a really interesting assertion, because the kid might be the only one in the gang that never actually verbally contradicts the judge or explicitly stands up to him while they're in Mexico, right? Toadvine actually threatens to shoot the judge in the face after the judge scalps a toddler. And when the kid and Toadvine don't want to massacre the peaceful tribe, it's Toadvine who actually says something to Glanton about it. Davy Brown calls the judge crazy when he says that war is God, and the priest refuses to agree with the judge's notions as well. But the judge gives a telling response to the priest that might as well apply to all of these guys. Ah, priest, what could I ask of you that you've not already given? Right, all of the gang members are so hardened and cynical, they aren't actually capable of expressing love anymore. The few times they verbally confront the judge, their protests don't mean anything. It's only the remnants of their dead Christian fathers uselessly echoing through them. In reality, the words mean nothing and have no power over these men's actions. It's just the mocking laughter of old phantoms. But the thing about the kid is he doesn't seem to have any of these concepts to begin with, and yet he is the only one actually capable of doing selfless acts. He protects the kid's sprawl, who has no use to him and is only holding him back. He also protects Shelby, who he's been ordered to kill, and who makes it very clear he would never do the same thing for him. And while the kid is helping people, he only ever says mean, cynical things while he's doing it. He basically has no concept of good or love or selflessness, but he embodies these things without knowing what they are. He has no reason to fake it or to be proud of himself. As per Christ's proverb, the right hand has absolutely no idea what the left hand is doing. An unmanufactured, unadulterated love shines through the kid, despite everything. And of course, the judge does not like that very much. Rather than being the self-created, ultimate embodiment of war, the kid is the one person out of step with the judge's war dance, and the only one to present a counter way of being, the only protest that isn't simply controlled opposition, not just the cry of phantoms, but something alive, a living threat, however small and weak it may actually be. Which brings us to the second perspective on the least of creatures the perspective of the judge. These anonymous creatures may seem little or nothing in the world, yet the smallest crumb can devour us. Right, this brings us back to what we were saying about the Inquisitor. Our images of the world and the systems of order we create necessarily preclude love, so the kid is the one thing the judge can never fully understand or encompass with his mind. Because of the kid, the judge cannot yet truly call himself suzerain of the earth. But also, like we were saying about Christ and the Inquisitor, the kid's protest isn't the most obviously effective one. It doesn't really change the events of the book very much. Everyone still dies and everyone still gets scalped. But McCarthy still insists that there is something essential about the innocence of the kid and the love he is able to embody. Which brings us to the final perspective on the least of creatures, the perspective of the priest. Godly wisdom resides in the least of things, so that it may well be the voice of the Almighty speaks most profoundly in such beings as live in silence themselves. He watched the kid. For let it go how it will, he said. God speaks in the least of creatures. The kid thought him to mean birds or things that crawl, but the ex-priest watching his head slightly cocked, said, No man is give leave of that voice. 
The kid spat into the fire and bent to his work. I ain't heard no voice, he said. When it stops, said Tobin, you'll know you've heard it all your life. Is that right? Aye. At night, said Tobin, when the horses are grazing and the company is asleep, who hears them grazing? Don't nobody hear them if they're asleep? Aye. And if they cease their grazing, who is it that wakes? Every man. I said the ex-priest. Every man. Innocent things like dogs and children do not accomplish very much in the world. But imagine if we suddenly had to live in a world without them. However dark this world is now, that's much darker. That's total darkness without the tiniest spark of hope. And in a sense, that's also the same darkness we would find ourselves in if our own innocence was suddenly extinguished from within ourselves. Even if you're already as cold and cynical as the Grand Inquisitor, things can be much darker. And that brings us to the ending of the book and to the death of the kid which is prefigured in the beginning of the book by that quote by Jakob Burma. It is not to be thought that the life of darkness is sunk in misery and lost as if in sorrowing. There is no sorrowing, for sorrow is a thing that is swallowed up in death, and death and dying are the very life of the darkness. That's a big part of what this book is about, the life of darkness, what we might call spiritual death or losing one's soul. But to put things in more secular terms, we can say that Burma is criticizing the idea that truly antisocial people are sad all the time and super disappointed by their inability to love. Like, if you're a social person capable of love, and tomorrow you woke up and you were a crocodile, you aren't going to be sad, and you aren't going to be all that joyful either, because you're a crocodile. Joy and sadness are inherently social emotions that reptiles don't feel, and supposedly people who score near-perfect scores on psychopath tests don't feel these things either. Instead, they just feel pleasure and boredom, and they desire constant stimulus. In case you can't imagine the difference between joy and pleasure, when I think of pleasure in its purest form, I think of somebody sitting at a slot machine. Because if you look at a person's face when they're pulling the lever, it's completely blank. They look dead, but they are experiencing an immense amount of pleasure every time they pull the lever and just before they do it again. To feel pleasure, you constantly have to be doing something. But to feel joy, you don't have to be doing anything in a sense. You can just sit around and feel joyful. But the thing you can't avoid doing when you feel joy is wagging your tail or smiling. Joy and sadness are hard to hide because they are social emotions. They're contagious. We spread them around. Because pleasure and boredom are how our biology gets us to act individually. And joy and sadness is how it gets us to act communally in groups more or less. The point being, if I made you a crocodile, you wouldn't be sad, but it would be a kind of death for you. You'd be half the being you used to be, with a much more limited palette of experiences. The world created by your mind would go through a sort of trash compactor and lose a few dimensions. The social being, the part of you that can connect with something bigger than itself, or connect with anything outside itself at all, would be dead. But the rest of you would still remain in the world, eating and drinking and whatever. And this is the sort of spiritual death the kid himself seems to go through before his actual death at the hands of the judge. And on one level of allegory, his death and final embrace by the judge seems to symbolize the potential for our own egos to finally consume our last bit of innocence and perhaps for us to stop hearing that voice once and for all. If we look at the sort of books McCarthy was reading while writing Blood Meridian, he was really interested in the theme of saints in the desert being tempted by the devil, 
like, for instance, in Flaubert's The Temptation of St. Anthony. And obviously, the judge is a devil figure that is tempting the kid throughout the book to sell his soul and to be like him. And these themes get really on the nose when they have their showdown in the desert. Right, The priest tells the kid to cover his ears as to not be tempted by the judge, and the whole gunfight follows some weird kind of mystical logic where neither can bring themselves to kill the other for seemingly inexplicable reasons, which mirrors the unresolved showdown between Christ and the Grand Inquisitor. But interestingly, things do resolve later on, and the impasse eventually does have a winner. After leaving the desert and returning to civilization, the kid begins the process of giving in to the judge. Like other members of Glanton's gang, he tries to carry around the dead concepts of their Christian fathers. He had a Bible that he found at the mining camps, and he carried this book with him, no word of which he could read. It's a religion he never had and can never truly come to understand. He has a vague desire for redemption and for forgiveness that he will never be able to articulate to himself. But he finds himself stuck in the past all the same, and continues to wear an albatross of human ears around his neck. He tries to become a protector, but his loving acts can no longer materialize in the present moment. He finds a cave of people long dead, much like those he had helped to kill long ago. He tells an old lady there that he's there to save her. But when he reached into the little cove and touched her arm, she moved slightly, her whole body light and rigid. She weighed nothing. She was just a dried shell, and she had been dead in that place for years. He desperately wants to do a loving act, but he's stuck always reaching into the past and trying to protect those who are long dead. And the past continues to mock him to a point that he eventually decides to kill it. This scene in the cave is the last we see of the kid, and when he's presented to us again, he's now called the man. And the man is not a very nice guy. He kills a young boy, much like a younger version of himself. And then we find out something very strange about this young boy he's killed. The friends of the murdered boy tell the man about the boy's origins. His granddaddy was killed by a lunatic and buried in the woods like a dog. By some coincidence, this seems to be a direct reference to the judge's story about fathers. This comment seems to imply that the judge's story was actually based on real events after all, and the murdered boy was actually the murdered man's grandson. Regardless, the poetic connection seems to be telling us that this moment is once again about the Freudian idea of killing your father in order to become a man. And in a sense, the man did kill his father, because in a sense the kid is the father of the man. And by killing the young boy, he is symbolically killing the child he once was. Right? The man isn't trapped, failing to live up to the image of a dead father figure per se, but he is trapped, failing to live up to the child he once was, Mocking laughter comes from his past innocence, so he kills it once and for all, and then all joy and all sorrowing are swallowed up in death. And now that he is dead spiritually, the man is finally totally subject to the judge, who can do whatever he wants with him. In the final image of the man, it's as if he's being absorbed into the judge, and they are finally becoming one. He gathered him up in his arms, against his immense and terrible flesh, and shot the wooden bar latch home behind him. That's pretty much the ending of the book, insofar as the book describes the individual journey and death of a human soul. But that's only one layer of what this book is about. Like we said at the beginning, it's also a doomsday prophecy. This ending is also about the soul of Western civilization and of all of humanity. In order to understand that side of things, let's continue on to the book's epilogue. I'm not going to read it to you, but basically there's this guy with a metal stick, and he's poking it into the ground and taking out some kind of natural resource, some kind of Promethean fire. He leaves a lot of bones behind him, and people are following him, 
and there's two groups of these people, the ones who pick up the bones and look at them, and the ones who don't, and they all follow based on some kind of mindless, self-fulfilling prophecy. So first off, who is the guy everyone else is following? I think it's pretty safe to say it's the judge, right? At the end of the book, the judge is leading a dance, and beforehand he tells the kid, this is an orchestration for an event, for a dance in fact. The participants will be appraised of their roles at the proper time. None here can finally comprehend the reason for his presence. The judge has successfully become suzerain of the earth, things and people effortlessly bend towards his will, following his dance without knowing why. And also, like the guy with the stick, the judge is shown earlier in the book to be a sort of Promethean figure who steals fire from the depths of the earth. Right? The priest tells the story about the gang first meeting the judge, and they're out of gunpowder and running from Apaches. And the judge takes them to a cave and finds niter, and then gathers other materials and makes gunpowder for them. Then the priest describes a speech given by the judge. He concluded with the telling us that our mother the earth, as he said, was round like an egg, and contained all good things within her. This scene is actually a long extended reference to a scene in Paradise Lost, where in the depths of hell, Lucifer makes gunpowder for his demon legions. In Paradise Lost, Lucifer is the ultimate embodiment of pride, and the desire to be as powerful as God himself. But Paradise Lost is also making the point that we human beings are like Lucifer when we make stuff like gunpowder. Gunpowder is a type of power we steal from God in order to try to become like him. It's yet another bite we've taken from the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge. But of course, there are many other kinds of Promethean fire we can be said to steal from nature or God. What the man with the stick is striking out of the earth could be gunpowder, it could be oil, it could be uranium, it could be silicon. I think it represents any resource that is used to measure power at any given era of civilization. And maybe each successive whole actually contains a new different resource as we go further down the march of progress. And maybe this guy with the stick isn't actually Judge Holden anymore. Maybe he's actually a new version of the judge. Right? The judge is the ultimate embodiment of war, the one with his face on the coin standing over the shoulder of God. But what the person who embodies war looks like changes drastically with new technology. Right? At the end of the book, the judge is lamenting the end of the age of the warrior. As war becomes dishonored and its nobility called into question, those honorable men who recognize the sanctity of blood will become excluded from the dance. And thereby will the dance become a false dance, and the dancers false dancers. And yet, there will always be one there who is a true dancer. And can you guess who that might be? The fundamental nature of war hasn't changed. It's still war, and the stakes are all the same. One will crushes another. People are still killed and eradicated from the earth. But the embodiment of war is no longer the warrior himself. The lords, kings, and emperors of the past were pretty much all professional soldiers who actually led armies into battle or fought themselves. But nowadays, the ultimate beneficiaries of war are almost never warriors. At the highest level, the will dominating all other wills looks very different. The warrior with his gunpowder and his six-shooters was replaced by the oil man and his oil and vast sums of money, and eventually he's also replaced by the tech nerd with his silicon and computers and even vaster sums of money. We used to have Judge Holden, maybe now it's Judge Bezos. That's just a silly example, but the point is, there's a different class of people now being favored by Prometheus, and harnessing the fire of the gods and vying to be suzerain of the earth. Ultimately, though, this change is largely only a change in the aesthetic of war and the degrees of hypocrisy and self-deception. Modern war might seem more clean and innocent because the average person doesn't see a lot of trees of dead babies these days. They're probably still out there somewhere, though, 
and we might see them again sooner than we think. But often, we are quite successful at distancing ourselves from the realities of war and at giving ourselves lots of room to lie to ourselves. Despite seeming cleaner, though, modern war is in a lot of ways much less innocent than the openly brutal wars of the past. And the death of the kid is in part a symbol for the death of a more innocent age of war. In McCarthy's No Country for Old Men, a character describes the Vietnam War by saying, If we'd have sent them without rifles, I don't know as they'd have been all that much worse off. You can't go to war like that. You can't go to war without God. And this character also suggests that the Vietnam War is not necessarily the moment that the United States lost its soul, but it was a symbol of that overall process. If you haven't read the book or seen the movie, No Country for Old Men gives a very nihilistic portrayal of the post-Vietnam United States. And I bring it up because this also happens to be the era in which McCarthy is writing Blood Meridian. It's likely not a coincidence that the kids' war experiences and consequent psychological turmoil do seem to be modeled, at least in part, on that of returning Vietnam vets, right? The kid is also thrown into a war without God. As the Mennonite warns him before he follows Captain White's expedition into Mexico, The wrath of God lies sleeping. Hell ain't half full, hear me. You carry a war of a madman's making unto a foreign land, you'll wake more than the dogs. And a war without God describes Glanton's expedition even more so. The kid doesn't know why he's in a foreign land fighting someone else's enemies. And they aren't even fighting those enemies. They're avoiding them and only fighting the tribes that don't pose a threat in the first place. And then in the end, they're fighting the people they swore to protect. It's not that this mirrors one for one the events in Vietnam, but it does set up a similar psychological meat grinder for the kid. So long as the kid is in Mexico, and he has the brotherhood of the gang, he can more or less hold himself together. At least he can tell himself he's fighting to protect the guy next to him. But when he gets home, obviously no one is going to see the kid as a protector or as a hero. It would be quite accurate, actually, to call him a baby killer. He really can't tell anyone the things he's seen or the things he's done. And that's not necessarily been the case for most wars throughout history. Glanton's campaign and the Vietnam War depart from past wars because they are in a sense anti-social wars, or wars without love, or without God. And it's obvious why this is the case with Glanton's War, because they're actually a gang of anti-social criminals. They might be the only family the kid has ever known, but they're also all basically crocodiles that leave each other for dead at a moment's notice. And it's important to clarify something about the term antisocial here, because people often mistakenly make antisocial synonymous with evil, which is completely ridiculous, because the most evil, terrifying things people do aren't antisocial behavior. Usually, war and genocide are pro-social behavior. Reptiles don't go to war or commit organized genocide in nature but wolves and chimpanzees definitely do. As the judge says, Wolves call themselves man. What other creatures could? Only a social loving creature could ever dream up these things, because love and war are nearly inseparable. As the judge also says, What joins men together is not the sharing of bread, but the sharing of enemies. As disturbing as it is, these things do fall into the normal range of well-adjusted human behavior. For instance, it's the Apache warriors that are the ones making the trees of dead babies. And they aren't self-centered criminals like the people in Glanton's gang. They are probably, for the most part, fairly psychologically healthy dudes. They can probably go home to their families, hug their children, and can be more or less open about all the violent things they did that day. Because they know for a fact that they are fighting for their families, and their families know for a fact that they are fighting for them. The violence brings them all closer together. And the Apaches can actually be more explicitly brutal in a lot of ways precisely because they don't have anything to hide from themselves. Like we said, 
Toadvine threatens to shoot the judge for scalping a toddler. But the Glanton's gang still kills basically just as many babies as the Apaches do. The main difference is that the people in Glanton's gang often have to go through a weird song and dance to distance themselves from their actions and responsibility. And before Blood Meridian was published, very similar ideas were already being applied directly to the Vietnam War. I don't know if McCarthy was a fan of Apocalypse Now, but basically in the movie, the character Colonel Kurtz tells a story about going into a village and inoculating all the children of the village for polio. And then the fathers of the village chop off all the inoculated arms of the children and throw them in a pile for the American soldiers to see. And Kurtz has this big realization, and he says, These weren't monsters, these were men who fought with their hearts, who have families, who have children, who are filled with love. And Kurtz gets to wondering why the American army can't fight like that in Vietnam. And he tries to fight like that, to fight without lies, to stick heads on sticks the whole nine yards, but it doesn't go very well for him psychologically. The idea being that America is sending these guys to war and also telling them at the same time, in a million different ways, it's not okay to be a warrior. So these guys are being split in half psychologically. And now, in modern times, we're having guys operate military drones from a room completely divorced from the battlefield, almost pretending like they're playing a video game or something. And these guys are handling it a lot worse psychologically than guys back in the day who were personally cutting off heads using sharp rocks. We have to distance ourselves from war and make it look cleaner and cleaner because we all know there's less and less love in it. The death of the kid represents the end of the age of the warrior because without innocence and without love, there can be no warriors. This is why the judge has just a little respect left for the man at the end of the book and almost seems a little bit disappointed to see him go. The dance won't be quite the same without him, without love. It'll feel just a little bit phony and a little more self-hating. But the judge will always remain, and at its core, war will stay true. Now there's an interesting question, which is, is all the change we've been talking about merely a temporary stage or season? As per the judge's philosophy, are we in the West simply degenerates? Is this just the fall of Rome all over again? Maybe we're weary of war and lacking in love because we're simply ready to die and be replaced by new peoples. As the judge puts it, the way of the world is to bloom and to flower and die. But in the affairs of men, there is no waning, and the noon of his expression signals the onset of night. His spirit is exhausted at the peak of its achievement. His meridian is at once his darkening and the evening of his day. This you see here, these ruins wandered at by tribes of savages. Do you think that this will not be again? I and again with other people, with other sons. Right, maybe it's all cyclical, and some group of people will come along and kill us and fuse with us and make a new Western world that has some love in it and doesn't hate itself when going to war. And then eventually, all the same things will happen to them too. It's very possible that that's part of the equation for McCarthy. But his views of history do seem to be ultimately quite linear. Let's return to the man with his stick poking his holes in the ground. The holes run in a straight line, and the fire he steals from the earth presumably can never be put back. The people behind him may seem to take looping paths, to look back and to hesitate before continuing forward, but ultimately, all seem to follow the judge towards some unforeseen finale. We've already discussed the Yaka Burma quote at the beginning of the book, but that's only one of three quotes that starts off Blood Meridian. And one way of seeing these different quotes is that each quote at the beginning introduces a different scale or level of allegory for the book's message. The quote from Burma introduces us to the theme of the turmoil and death of an individual soul. And the second quote by Paul Valery is about the turmoil and death of the soul of Western civilization. The quote actually comes from a dialogue where Valerie writes from the perspective of a fictional Chinese philosopher, 
who is criticizing the Western mind. And I'll show you a slightly longer version of the quote than what actually appears at the beginning of the book, because I think it makes the connection to the themes of Blood Meridian even clearer. Valerie's fictional Chinese philosopher says, For you, intelligence is not one thing among many. Every day, it devours everything. It would like to put an end to a new state of society every morning. A man intoxicated on it believes his own thoughts are legal decisions, or facts themselves, born of the crowd and time. You are in love with intelligence, until it frightens you. For your ideas are terrifying, and your hearts are faint. Your acts of pity and cruelty are absurd, committed with no calm, as if they were irresistible. Finally, you fear blood more and more. Blood and time. And I think very similar ideas are echoed by the hermit that the kid meets towards the beginning of the book. Man can know his heart, but he don't want to. Rightly so. Best not to look in there. It ain't the heart of a creature that is bound in the way that God has set for it. When God made man, the devil was at his elbow. A creature that can do anything. Make a machine, and a machine to make the machine. An evil that can run itself a thousand years. No need to tend it. We've already said plenty about why the West fears blood more and more, and why we're afraid to know our own hearts. But why do we fear time? Well, like Valerie is saying, in the West we worship progress above all else, social, political, economic, etc., etc. But in some sense, all of these are only branches extending off of technological progress. Technology is the thing that imposes a linear structure onto history. And being ahead in technological development has long been the source of the Western world's power. We've generally been the first to accept each new Faustian bargain, and the first to try to make ourselves like God. The more of it we get, the more of it we want, but at the same time, we become even more terrified by our own seemingly limitless power. The more control we have over every inch of nature, the more isolated we become from the world, from each other, and from ourselves. The more we become one with the judge, and blind to where our true path lies. This is almost too big of a cliché to mention, since it could be said of almost every main character of a Wild West story ever, but the death of the kid also symbolizes the death of the American frontier. America's last bit of natural innocence finally being conquered by industrial civilization. Every inch of nature finally being put under the dominion and gaze of the judge. And at least on one level, Western civilization is the judge, since we're the ones currently carrying the stick and leading the march of progress. And of course, we do leave quite a few bones behind us. I believe the bones in the epilogue are probably like the buffalo bones at the beginning of the last chapter. They represent dead cultures, dead traditions, dead peoples. Things that are gone, as if they'd never been at all. But what about the people that either pick at the bones, or head on without looking back? I think these two groups basically represent progressive or conservative people or peoples, right? The progressives don't look back. They think the march is headed somewhere great. The bones only represent the ignorant errors of the past to them. And the dawn of a new kind of human being is just over the horizon. But of course, the end of history is not the one they envisage. Because ultimately, history can only tend towards the judge. The conservatives lament the bones and say, If only we could go back to this particular era in history. But these laments are as false as those given by the members of Glanton's gang. They hunger for the power of God just as much as everyone else, and ultimately follow the judge's march of progress and technological development with equal enthusiasm. Their laments are only the useless echoes of their dead fathers speaking through them, and these bones they hold are actually the bones of their own fathers, the fathers they themselves have helped to kill. All follow behind the judge as mindlessly as the members of Glanton's gang, and are destined for a similar catastrophic end. And there are no true mutineers among us. The West currently leads the march, but the whole world follows behind us. By coming into contact with the West, and trading and making war, 
all must inevitably become like him and join his linear history. The story of the kid is the story of the West, and in turn, the story of the West is the story of the entire world. Perhaps someone will defeat the West and take lead of the march, but regardless, all will reach the same destination eventually. Ultimately, the names and places are largely arbitrary, and for McCarthy, this story was written in the human heart from the beginning. Here is the final quote that begins Blood Meridian. Clark and UC Berkeley colleague Tim D. White also said that a re-examination of a 300,000-year-old fossil skull shows evidence of having been scalped. War is much older than man, and it's always been here waiting for us to take it to its natural conclusions. This whole story has only been the inevitable continuation and unfolding of war. Or to give another version of these ideas, I'm going to turn to a speech from McCarthy's undirected screenplay, Whales and Men. If you can find this screenplay online somewhere, I don't necessarily recommend reading the whole thing, but you should definitely read the whole version of this speech. It's incredible, and it also gives the most concise summary of the ideas of Blood Meridian that McCarthy has ever given. But basically, this character is talking about this time when he was a young man sick in bed and thinking about the nature of evil, and he begins his search by looking for something concrete in his experience that he can compare with evil. What was evil? Evil was like fear. It was more like fear than anything else I could think of. And he explains how he got to that connection. I got to thinking about the saints. And the thing I noticed was while they were all very different sorts of people, there was one thing which they all had in common. That was fearlessness. Right? He explains that you could probably say something like all the saints were loving or they were all kind. But in reality, that looks like so many different kinds of behavior. Right? Some saints are gentle and others hit you on the head with a stick. But however they express love, in order to express it, they all had to be without fear, or at least uncontrolled by their fear, because he explains that fear and love cannot occupy the same space at the same time. It's one or the other. And of course, that makes things very difficult when love is one of the things we fear most, like with Christ and the Grand Inquisitor. He says, Love itself was helpless in the face of fear. I saw that the need for power, for instance, was driven by fear. If you were not afraid, what would you need power for? And of course, that need for power gives birth to the judge, our ego, which as we become more powerful, inevitably absorbs us. And then, if we take that individual story and we project it out to the entire world, basically, we're all screwed. He concludes, I saw that the psychological truth of Genesis was impeccable. We always knew that our desire to be God would kill us off. And that's why the story of the kid is the story of the entire world, as McCarthy warns us when he introduces him to us at the beginning of the book. All history present in that visage, the child, the father of the man. Now let's take one final look at the image of the judge seeming to absorb the kid at the end of the book, because it's actually a beautiful allegory for our relationship to fear, and it's a mere image of the ending of Moby Dick. If you haven't read it, you probably already know more or less how things work out for Captain Ahab. But, if you really don't want that spoiled for you, go ahead and skip this slide. Moby Dick is one of the biggest literary influences on Blood Meridian, and both in turn are heavily influenced by Paradise Lost as well as the Book of Job. In fact, the symbol of the great white whale, Moby Dick, is largely a reference to a symbol in the book of Job. In the book of Job, Job is terrified by his endless suffering and the seeming evil of the universe, and starts to become bold and starts to lash out and criticize God. So God shows up in a whirlwind and humbles Job, and God shows him many things that are too big for men to comprehend like the many complexities of the natural world. And eventually, he shows him two creatures, the behemoth and Leviathan, which represent God's power along with the terror of the universe. Because the Leviathan 
is unimaginably huge compared to Job, and can kill Job with a single breath. But compared to God, even the Leviathan is nothing, and God could easily crush a million Leviathans and eat them all for breakfast. But he challenges Job to try to do the same, to show Job how small he truly is. And God says, Canst thou drought Leviathan with a hook? And Job knows he definitely can't do that. And ultimately, Job submits to God's authority and accepts his own powerlessness. But in Moby Dick, Herman Melville asks the question, what if Job's ego was so unbelievably massive that he took God's challenge and was like, yeah, yeah, give me a hook. Come on, come on, I'll kill Leviathan right now. The white whale Moby Dick, like the Leviathan, is a symbol for God's power and the terror of the universe. And killing Moby Dick is the closest Ahab can get to killing God. He says, All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks, but some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask! How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near to me. That inscrutable thing beyond it is chiefly what I hate. And when his first mate criticizes him for his overwhelming, incredible pride, Ahab says, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. And like Lucifer in Paradise Lost, Ahab is a metaphor for the pride of all of mankind, because the sperm whale contains the Promethean fire of spermaceti oil, which human beings are once again using to be like God. Sorry for the 10,000th Prometheus Tree of Knowledge slash Faust reference, I'll try to stop now. But now let's look back at the judge, because he has interesting connections to both the white whale Moby Dick and Captain Ahab. Obviously, the judge is a giant hairless all-white man who is described as looking like a porpoise. He's Moby Dick. He's the Leviathan. But also, he's simultaneously Ahab as well, right? The freedom of birds is an insult to me, and I'd strike the sun if it insulted me, are basically the same silly line. And the ending of Moby Dick mirrors the ending of Blood Meridian. Ahab disappears into the sea as he clings to the white whale's massive and terrible flesh. And if the judge did have any origin that could explain where he comes from, it might be that Ahab and Moby Dick fused under the water and the judge sprung out of the sea. He's their baby. That is to say that the symbol of the judge seems to fuse the symbols of Moby Dick and Captain Ahab, and thereby suggest that our fear has turned us into the Leviathan. We've become like God, but now the thing we fear most is ourselves. And the judge in turn absorbing the kid seems to suggest that fear will eventually absorb us completely, and everything else. Love will be totally annihilated. Fear will be the only experience and form of life that exists, if any life exists at all. There is room on the stage for one beast and one alone. All others are destined for a night that is eternal and without name. One by one, they will step down into the darkness before the footlamps. Bears that dance, bears that don't. All right, that's all, folks. End of the video. Have a nice day. Of course, I can't actually leave it like that, especially after saying McCarthy was always looking for the tiniest little sparks of hope. He definitely thought that the human race was screwed. But, as he said in an NPR interview, I'm pessimistic about a lot of things, but there's no reason to be miserable about it. And he also said that people are usually pretty bad at making predictions. First off, who's to say technological progress won't stop tomorrow? Maybe nature will decide to set some limits somewhere, even if we're totally incapable of setting those limits on ourselves. Obviously, that's just not what we're made of. There might be some fearless saints somewhere out there, but they're always going to be the exceptions that prove the rule. Saints don't usually live very long or have a lot of kids. They're always sacrificing themselves for others, so clearly we're descended from the other guys. Everyone alive is descended from fearful men. Don't expect us 
to start saying no to Mephistopheles anytime soon. For McCarthy, there's almost certainly no redemptive end to human history. But maybe there's some other kind of hope we can find in Blood Meridian. Although, if there is any, we're probably better off finding it in his other books first, then coming back to Blood Meridian, because whatever hope might be in there is pretty hard to find. If there's any unofficial sequel to Blood Meridian, I'd say it's The Road. Blood Meridian ends with the end of the world, and The Road begins with it. And in some ways, it's actually the more mature book, because it's coming after McCarthy has his son. And the story is about a father and a son surviving during the apocalypse. And there's a beautiful line that reads, Then they set out along the blacktop in the gunmetal light, shuffling through the ash, each the other's world entire. Right? Maybe the history of man has ended in calamity, and maybe all men will disappear from the earth sometime soon. But at least for now, the father and his son have their own world and their own history together. And as long as they have each other, their lives make some sense. The father may not know what the future holds, but he knew that the child was his warrant. He said, if he is not the word of God, God never spoke. And there's a similar nice quote from Dostoevsky. And if there are two of you who come together thus, there is already a whole world, a world of living love. But can we find anything remotely similar in Blood Meridian? Maybe, maybe not. At the very least, there's this nice image when the kid finally returns from the desert and sits on a beach and sees a horse. There was a horse standing there, staring out upon the darkening waters, and a young colt that cavorted and trotted off and came back. The colt stood against the horse with its head down, and the horse was watching, out there past men's knowing, where the stars are drowning, and whales ferry their vast souls through the black and seamless sea. Right, the horse is stirring off into the void, but he's also got his baby with him, so he's got something to protect and something to do. That might be a bit of a stretch, but that's also the only positive relationship I could find in Blood Meridian, so that's the best I can do for you on that end. But there is one last image from the book that is definitely somewhat hopeful. One last echo of the idea that God speaks through the smallest of creatures. When the kid is separated from the gang and wanders alone through the desert, he finds a burning tree. It was a lone tree burning on the desert a heraldic tree that the passing storm had left afire. The solitary pilgrim, drawn up before it, had traveled far to be here, and he knelt in the hot sand and held his numbed hands out, while all about in that circle attended companies of lesser auxiliaries, routed forth into the inordinate day, small owls that crouched silently and stood from foot to foot, and tarantulas and solpigas and vinegaroons, and the vicious megal spiders, and beaded lizards with mouths black as a chow dog's, deadly to man, and the little desert basilisks, that jet blood from their eyes, and the small sand vipers, like seemly gods, silent and the same, in Jada, in Babylon, a constellation of ignited eyes that edge the ring of light, all bound in a precarious truce, before this torch, whose brightness had set back the stars, in their sockets. All the little creatures bend to the word of God, and sitting in silence, understand a truth that eludes the powerful. And don't forget, you're one of the little creatures too, or at least you used to be, so try to hold on to that as long as you can. All right, finally, time for further reading. As mentioned, read that speech from Whales and Men as soon as possible. The script as a whole probably wouldn't have made a great movie, but that speech on its own is amazing. It starts on page 53, ends on 59. The script has never been officially published. I don't know if it can legally be copied or sold, so I'm not going to tell you exactly how to find it, but you will find it pretty easily. Generally, in McCarthy's books, the evil characters are very articulate and well-spoken, and the good characters don't say very much. 
so we rarely get characters that seem to just directly say McCarthy's own thoughts. In this script, though, some of the characters definitely just seem to say McCarthy's thoughts. Similarly, if you haven't read McCarthy's play The Sunset Limited or seen the movie version, it probably has McCarthy's most saintly character, who also talks a lot. It also might be his most obvious ripoff of the Grand Inquisitor scene. One character is definitely Ivan Karamazov, and the other one is definitely his brother Losha. It's definitely worth reading or watching. It's one of my favorite works by McCarthy, and it's nice and short. After Blood Meridian, I'd say McCarthy's other book with the most philosophical speeches is The Crossing. There's many, many retellings of the Book of Job in it. And just so you know, you don't need to read all the pretty horses before reading The Crossing. The Crossing is only considered a sequel because characters from both books join up in a later book, City of the Plains. But without that fact, these two books have very little in common. Even stylistically, they're completely different. So go ahead and read The Crossing first if you want something more like Blood Meridian. But All the Pretty Horses is also a good book and a bit easier to get through if you did want to start there. Now Blood Meridian has too many literary influences for me to recommend all of them, so I'm going to cheat and recommend a book called Books Are Made Out of Books. It's by a McCarthy scholar, and it's basically just a list of books that McCarthy was reading at the time of writing particular books, including Blood Meridian. It was very useful for making this video, and it might be a useful resource for you too. I would definitely recommend all the literary influences I already mentioned in this video, but if I could only recommend one, it would be the Book of Job. You might not get as much out of it on your first reading as you would with something more contemporary like The Brothers Karamazov or Moby Dick or even Paradise Lost. The Book of Job is a weird book that might challenge some of your expectations for what a book even is, but I genuinely think it's something you could come back to for the rest of your life and its symbols would become more and more useful for you over time. It's also much, much shorter than those other books. Speaking of short books that influence Blood Meridian, Books Are Made Out of Books mentions McCarthy reading stuff by Oswald Spengler, who wrote a very long book called The Decline of Western Civilization. I have not read and cannot recommend it for that reason, but I did read a much, much shorter book by Spengler called Man and Technics, it's not something that personally stuck with me as much as anything else on this list. But if you're interested in the end of Western civilization and apocalyptic sides of Blood Meridian, the influence of Spangler should be pretty clear and give a less spiritual and less mythological version of some of the same ideas. Now I'm going to recommend a few things that didn't necessarily influence Blood Meridian at all, but might help you further explore some related themes. In regards to evil and the psychological aspects of the book, I really like a popular science book that has an absolutely terrible title, The Psychopath Whisperer. It is by a leading researcher in the subject, and it gives you a lot of anecdotes and fun facts about psychopaths. Like I said, I don't think antisocial and evil are one for one the same thing, but it's still a significant part of the discussion. Interestingly, this guy claims that psychopaths don't experience fear which is a disturbing and fun thing to contemplate in conjunction with McCarthy's idea about saints being fearless. Now, as per the pro-social side of evil, there's way too many good books about genocide. But if I had to recommend just one thing on the subject, it would actually be the documentary film The Act of Killing. I'm not going to explain the premise of this movie, but it is genius. It is one of my favorite movies, fictional or otherwise. And it follows a man much like the kid from Blood Meridian, a career criminal and ex-Death Squad member, who is a little more on the sensitive side than the other Death Squad guys, and isn't handling the things he's done quite as well as everyone else. It's some pretty complicated stuff. And as per the American history and Vietnam connections, the film Olzana's Raid is a very brutal Wild West war movie about U.S. soldiers hunting a group of Apaches, and many people think it's actually an allegory for Vietnam. And similarly, it contrasts the psychological turmoil of the Americans with the not-psychological turmoil of the Apache warriors, who do some incredibly brutal stuff in the movie, but are nonetheless portrayed pretty sympathetically. Go ahead and throw a party, and watch it as a double bill with Apocalypse Now. Finally, I'm definitely just recommending things I like at this point, and I'm not going to bother putting this on the slide, but I'm a big Leonard Cohen fan and his apocalyptic song The Future 
always makes me think of Blood Meridian a little bit. I think it's pretty fun. Alright, I really need to stop now. Have a nice day.